Welcome to Medscape Oncology Insights. I'm Kathy Miller, Professor of Oncology at Indiana University. Joining me today is Dr. Harold Burstein, a Professor of Medicine at the Harvard Medical School and a breast oncologist at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Thank you, Hal. Hey, Kathy. Great to be back. So I asked you to join me today to talk about what's new and exciting in the world of breast cancer at ASCO this year. So let's just cut to the chase and talk about the ADCs. <laughs> uh, I was walking over here and I ran into some lung cancer colleagues and they're like, how does breast cancer always have such, such exciting things? And I assured them it wasn't just me. Uh, but uh, the data this year, the big story is the Destiny Breast 04 trial. This is the trastuzumab deruxtecan antibody drug conjugate. That drug already approved in HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer. The DB04 trial was a study of this HER2-low tumors, ER positive or negative, and then HER2-1 plus or 2 plus. It's actually a big group of breast cancers, about 50% of all breast cancers. It's a, a group that a couple of other agents and, and folks have tried to study before. Difficult to identify them, even though they, they're large, because in many databases, they just get written off as HER2-negative. Well, they probably are HER2 negative in the sense that I don't think there's like a biological subset here, but there are a spectrum of tumors that have a whiff of ER expression or lack thereof, but also have some degree of HER2 overexpression on the surface. Not, uh, it's important to note, tumors that are truly fish amplified or truly HER2 positive as we have conventionally understood that. And not the tumors that are HER2 IHC zero. So far, not yet, but the you know, the interesting thing here is, we'll talk about the data, but it's beginning to look like it doesn't matter how much HER2 there really is on these cells, this drug has activity. So this is really using HER2 as a flag, not as something to stop the signaling. I think that's probably correct, or, or perhaps uh, glue to sort of bring it into the area, if you will. That's the advantage of the antibody drug part of it. Uh, it sort of brings the chemotherapy into the tumor milieu, at least that's the sort of hand-waving cartoon sort of argument. Uh, and then it's a very potent chemotherapy molecule that's linked to the antibody as well. So randomized phase three trial, plenary publication, simultaneous publication in the New England Journal. This must work. It's a very clean and uh, you know, compelling study. So in this trial, patients who'd had previous chemotherapy for advanced breast cancer were randomized two to one to either trastuzumab deruxtecan or a dealer's choice of different chemotherapies, uh, iribulin, taxanes, gemcitabine, capecitabine, drugs like that. Most actually got iribulin in the control arm, presumably because almost everybody had had a taxane. Um, and the primary endpoints were progression-free and overall survival, and a dramatic benefit for both progression-free and overall survival um, in both the ER-positive HER2-low and in the ER-negative HER2-low subsets. Also dramatically different were the response rates, 50% response rates in refractory disease, both essentially triple negative and in ER-positive HER2-low um, versus 16% with our control chemotherapies. And one of the really sobering things here is just how little activity there is in refractory breast cancer for standard chemotherapy. Now that begs the question, this trial required patients to have had previous chemotherapy for advanced disease. Are you gonna stick to that? Okay, come next week when you're back in clinic? I think so. I mean, remember, for most women who have metastatic breast cancer, you're going to get multiple lines of therapy. And so it's not a question of, you know, yes or no on this drug. It's going to be a question of where do you sequence it. This study looked at more refractory disease, clear benefit, clear activity. There are some side effects. Uh, there is still a 10 to 12 percent risk of interstitial lung disease. There was a very small but measurable risk of uh, lethal uh, ILD. So that's something people have to be very aware of. And I'm sure that the company will be developing studies to move it earlier in the course of the treatment sequence, just as they have in HER2 positive breast cancer, where it began in more refractory, now looks like a very compelling second line, and, and they're taking on first line treatment as well. Now, this is not the only ADC that, no. that we need to talk about in terms of expanding. It's an ADC world, patients. and we're just living in it. Um, so the other drug that has gotten a lot of attention of late is Sacatuzumab govitecan, which of course is also already on the market, approved for refractory triple negative breast cancer based on the ASCENT trial. What we saw at ASCO this year was the so-called Tropics O2 study, shifting from triple negative breast cancer to ER positive HER2 negative breast cancer, as conventionally defined. Um, and again, comparing against standard chemotherapy drugs. Also effective, but the results more modest. I would say for sure. Uh, you know, here there was an improvement in progression-free survival. It went from around four months to five and a half months. Um, you know, not a huge uh, gap. So clearly an active drug. 
Um, but at the moment, um, it doesn't look like a game changer in the same way that the trastuzumab deruxtecan does. And this is, you'll, you're a journal editor, you'll yell at me for doing this, but if you sort of eyeball these things side to side, uh, trastuzumab deruxtecan looks like a, a far more active drug. In fact, it's probably the most active drug we have now in triple negative breast cancer as well as other subtypes. And if we focus on the hazard ratios, much greater improvement with trastuzumab. The hazard ratios are probably a little better there as well, though uh, there's so much issue about patient selection and tumor selection there that it's hard to read that uh, too. You can, you can overstate that pretty easily. Now, it's hard to talk about updates in breast cancer without thinking about our largest patient population, those who have ER positive disease. We have news here to inform practice of both our older patients and our younger patients. Yeah, so it, now we're shifting to early stage breast cancer. And, um, you know, it's important, I think, to th when we look at early stage disease these days to really imagine how we're sort of titering in or titering out treatment based on things like tumor risk. We're all familiar with using genomic assays for that. Um, and also patient health and uh, biology. So two very nice studies that I think will continue to uh, inform practice. Uh, one was the so-called ASTRA study, which was a long-term follow-up now of another study of ovarian suppression, a high-risk group of patients patients who got chemotherapy but remained premenopausal. Now with close to 10 years of follow-up, a 5% absolute difference favoring ovarian suppression in terms of preventing recurrence of breast cancer. Underscoring the point that ovarian suppression remains an active treatment approach. Clearly brings more side effects for younger women, um, but uh, and this might be something interesting to talk about, but you know, if you look at the data from Rxponder and TaylorX, where there's been that signal of activity in younger women, I really believe most of that is because of the ovarian suppression effects of chemotherapy, and, and these data support that idea, I think. So you, you know my bias is, is with you in the Rxponder data. The, the good news is we will, at some point, have data to, to see if that bias is true, because there will be uh, a large national study randomizing those patients. To I think so, but I actually think it's gonna be a really hard study to accrue to, and it takes five to 10 years to see these uh, late endocrine effects manifest. So um, sign up now for ASCO 2032, and we'll be talking we'll about talk whatever about that is. Um, you know, the other study was uh, a study called ASTER-70, which is a European trial, also ER-positive tumors, this time with high genomic grade uh, readouts. And, um, but they were older patients, uh, age 70 and older. And they randomized such patients to endocrine therapy alone with or without chemotherapy. And interestingly, no real benefit for chemotherapy there. So um, this adds to a, an existing literature that older patients get relatively little benefit from chemotherapy, and in this case, even if you select for these higher risk, uh, higher grade, higher genomic indices scores, um, there's really very negligible benefit. So in your next clinic, when you see a, a reasonably healthy, but perhaps not out on the tennis court healthy 75 year old, are you still gonna send a genomic assay? You know, you have to really imagine in your mind you're going to give chemotherapy. We actually just did it in internal quality analysis at our program, and the breakpoint was at 72 years. Uh, so up to 72, people were ordering a lot of recurrence scores and trying to see if they might think about chemo. Beyond that, almost never. So um, I'm not sure that that's exactly the right number, but it's pretty uncommon to give women in their mid to late 70s adjuvant chemotherapy for ER-positive breast cancer. So when we think about ER positive breast cancer in the early stage setting, we also have to think about bone health. Really important to monitor patients' bone health, but there has been discussion for decades about whether skeletal protective therapy might reduce recurrences, might improve survival. The, the results have been decidedly mixed, but we did see results, long-term results of the ABCSG denosumab study today. That's right. So many of us have gotten into the habit of giving zoledronic acid or other bisphosphonates, and a meta-analysis supports the idea that those both preserve bone health in postmenopausal women and can also help prevent recurrence in the bone uh, for patients who have higher risk uh, ER positive tumors in particular. Um, it's been a little less clear for the rank ligand inhibitor denosumab whether that would be the case. There have been two big studies of this. The DCARE study reported a year and a half ago really showed no benefit in terms of using denosumab to prevent recurrence of breast cancer. At this meeting, we saw an update with long-term follow-up from the ABCSG18 trial from Michael Gannant. And in that trial, 
Denosumab actually did lower the rate of fractures, but also seems to be associated with an overall survival benefit. The data are a little quirky in the sense that it's not so clear what's driving that survival. Is it osteoporosis or bone health? Is it truly breast cancer recurrence, of which there's a little bit of benefit? And it's also very hard to reconcile those two trials of denosumab, though they're very different patient populations. DCARE was a high risk, lots of chemotherapy, lots of hormone receptor negative tumors. The ABCSG trial, uh, mostly stage one and two, ER positive, less chemotherapy tumors. So perhaps there'll be some brilliant biostatistician who will reconcile this. I think for the moment, if you're gonna give bone health or bone modifying therapy, I think zoledronic acid remains the agent of choice. And the discussions will continue. The discussions will continue. So the last study I wanna ask you about is an NRG study. A another study that took a long time to, to get done. Uh, but gave really important results for the management of patients with oligometastatic disease. Yeah, this is a very nice study. And, you know, credit to the cooperative groups because it's both hard to do these studies, takes a long time, there is not pharma support for them and the same thing, but it's a very compelling clinical question. The question is, if you meet a patient who has metastatic disease with oligometastatic sites, and they define that as four or fewer sites, which might be amenable to local therapy, either surgical resection or focal stereotactic radiosurgery. Would zapping or removing all of those oligometastatic sites improve the long-term outcomes in addition to systemic therapy? So it was a randomized trial, it was a randomized phase two study. The idea was to generate both feasibility and safety data and look for outcomes. And what they showed was there was actually no benefit to prophylactically removing a lung nodule or zapping a bone lesion or going after up to four sites um, with a very focal approach in these oligometastatic patients. So standard of care remains systemic therapy, obviously using local therapies for palliation, whether it's painful bone lesion or uh, paracentesis or thoracentesis or other areas that need to be addressed. But the operating practice should not be to try and remove what is otherwise asymptomatic metastatic disease. So these patients with the oligometastatic disease are not that common in practice, but it's a common source of argument at, at tumor boards because it, it's hard when the radiation oncologist says, it would be easy, easy, low risk, low toxicity. The surgeon says I could take this out laparoscopically, video assisted. It's a great point. It's and hard to and say. And patients understand no. that point. Yeah, and I think one of the interesting things here is there was actually no benefit in progression-free survival, which I think is important because you might even imagine like, well, let's say you had a liver lesion. You know, if you zapped that liver lesion, would that buy you extra time before you needed chemotherapy or something like that? It just didn't play out that way. By the time breast cancer has metastasized, unfortunately, it's almost always uh, a, you know, an event that has disseminated tumor cells throughout the body. So the good news is we're getting better and better at our therapeutics, um, but a very important negative result that going after individual spots won't change the long-term outcomes. Well, it's been a pleasure as always to have you here and talk about some of the updates. It's been a good year for breast cancer. It's always a good year to be a breast cancer doctor. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you for joining me. And to you, our audience, thank you for joining this episode of Medscape Oncology Insights.